Hi everyone, hope you can hear me okay. I uh, hope you're all safe and well as well. Um, thank you for joining us today for the USIZA Enterprise Architecture Community of Practice webinar. I'm Lex Wilkinson, Chair of the EA Group, and I'm shortly going to be handing over to Paul Perry, who's presenting today's webinar. The session is being recorded and we will make it available uh, afterwards via the USIZA website. The subject of the webinar today is uncaging the data in your institution, stepping beyond GDPR. I've had a number of conversations with Paul and some of his colleagues at the University of Leeds over the last year or so uh, about the work they've been doing with data models and the data strategy. So I'm sure you're going to find it a really interesting webinar. Um, you can use the chat uh, facility to, to ask questions. Uh, myself and uh, Stefan Pajan, the uh, vice chair, will be monitoring these. Um, we'll, we'll just see how it goes and whether uh, whether Paul wants to ask, answer questions uh, during the presentation or at the end. Um, so thank you Paul for agreeing to share your work with us today. I'm going to hand over to you. That's all right. Um, if you let me know when people can see the screen or can they see it now? They should be able to see it now I believe. <laughs> if someone wants to confirm via the chat forum that'd be great. <laughs> Right, well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Paul Perry. I'm the head of data at the University of Leeds. It's an interim position, which will be coming to an end very soon because of COVID. But over the last year, me and my team have begun to put in place some techniques and tools to help us understand data better and uh, put in place an architectural meta model to show us where data fits within the enterprise and to help us work with it more effectively. Um, that's me uh, and I've been helped by my team. Uh, the name of one of them is up there, Stuart Banach, but there's also Richard Milton and Chris Powell who together form the data team at uh, the University of Leeds. Now I've entitled this Uncaging the Data because I think that in most of our institutions uh, the data is caged within our processes and unable to be used effectively. Uh, you may be further down the line than we are, but certainly in our organisation, we find that we struggle to share data across the organisation. And I think it's partly because of the way we look at it and the way we structure our architecture. So I'm going to have a look at why uh, the organisation is well, regards data as dangerous. Uh, have a look at the quick, the data is new, is the new oil, the new gold, all those attention grabbing headlines that tell us how wonderful data is if we can only release it. And I'll have a look at how we represent it in architecture and how we structure it. Uh, we'll have a brief look at why we feel that it's almost intrinsically entangled with the processes and difficult to extract. Uh, and then we'll look at what the real life of data is through our organisations uh, and how sadly it's recreated rather than reused. Uh, and then we'll look at how we're linking that to the use size of capability model and how that fits in with the overall enterprise architecture. And if we get this right, then at the end, we'll step through the looking glass and see where we go from here. So, why do people regard data as dangerous? They regard it as a risk. I think it's fairly obvious when you see uh, the headlines, there's data, uh, the things that hit the deadlines, uh, the headlines are when we get data breaches, when there's loss, personally identifiable information makes it out into the wide world or people lose their intellectual property. And so GDPR kicks in and there's fines, reputational damage. And in the worst cases, of course, uh, criminal proceedings. And it's not insubstantial fines. If we look at some of the things that have happened over the last few years, 400,000 for Talk Talk in 2018, there were a series of fines. Uh, and there are two still lurking in the backgrounds that the ICO uh, say that they're going to apply, but they haven't yet. 
they hit the headlines because the figures were so big. Because under GDPR, of course, you can fine an organization up to 4% of the uh, global turnover. So it's understandable why data is seen as a risk uh, for most organizations because they look at it in financial terms very often. But there is another risk around uh, the quality and the understanding and the standards that surround data. Now, again, I'm afraid here, the examples I've got are quite financially based, but it does uh, serve to show uh, the risks that surround it when we haven't got the correct quality or understanding or standards to support our data. So let's look at the first one. Um, Marilyn One Venus Probe back in 1962. Uh, this is about the only picture we've got of the Mariner One because it didn't get much further than this. Uh, when they were uh, transcribing a formula uh, into the software, then they transcribed it incorrectly and it was blown up shortly after takeoff. Uh, the rockets and the probe cost $20 million. Texaco oil rig in, I'm not sure how you pronounce this actually, Lake Pena, I think it is, uh, but it's out in uh, Louisiana. Uh, it was a 150 foot high oil rig in a freshwater lake. Again, actually, this isn't the picture of the oil rig because uh, there was a slight problem when they were drilling into this lake. Uh, underneath it, was a salt mine. They'd done all the calculations quite well. Unfortunately, uh, they'd not accounted for the fact that they didn't understand the map properly. They were using the wrong map projection and so they drilled into the salt mine. Uh, the rig itself, 150 foot tall, uh, cost them $5 million to build. And that's probably the best picture that we've got it of it at the moment because uh, it sank in a 10 foot lake. That lake's now 200 foot deep and it's a saltwater rather than a freshwater lake. Uh, the rest of that, the $45 million was the compensation that they had to pay to the salt mine. Also wrecked the ecology of that area. And we'll go back to uh, NASA for a final one in 1999. A very bold mission uh, to survey the climate on Mars. There was a slight issue with this. It wasn't to do with the quality of the information. It wasn't to do with their understanding of it. It was to do with the standards that they used in the navigation system. They used the wrong units for one aspect of it and they were being sent information in imperial pound for seconds rather than metric newton seconds. And so, unfortunately, this $125 million project came rather closer to Mars than was intended and ended up scattered across its surface. These are big problems, but they weren't. Uh, they were completely avoidable if they'd understood the quality and if they understood the data and if they'd understood the standard that they were using. That's one of the things that we need to understand when we're beginning to use data in our organizations. If we don't understand the data or the standards or the quality of that data, we will make poor decisions. Data also is a fantastic asset. It's often compared to the new gold or the new oil, and it has many similarities. But if we look at these things, uh, then gold and oil, well, they're more valuable when they're pure or refined. Uh, 
gold's scarce. Oil is still a finite resource. Uh, and gold has intrinsic value. Both of them, uh, because there are limited resources, actually that increases the value of them. I suppose there's another thing we can mention about oil, that is that if you don't control it properly, it becomes very messy. But if we look at data, how does that really compare? So, actually when you mix data with other things, with other, uh, with other pieces of data, we, we start to be able to mine more information out of it, more use out of it. The amount of data is increasing second by second. We can't say it's a finite resource. In fact, we struggle to keep up with its expansion. Unlike gold, that doesn't deteriorate. Actually, data does. We need to curate it carefully. We need to understand its context and its purpose and what it's trying to represent. Otherwise, it's of no use to us whatsoever. And data itself, I know a lot of people might argue with this, but data itself has no intrinsic value. It's just numbers and figures and artifacts. The value comes in what we do with it. And it doesn't matter how often we use it, it's not going to run out. I think the place where it's probably most like gold or oil is in one of its final aspects. If we don't control it properly, it is very, very messy and very expensive, as we can see from the examples that we saw earlier and hundreds of smaller examples that we find in our organizations. To help understand the use and the purpose of data, uh, we try to incorporate it into our architecture as a component. Uh, now, what we're doing in Leeds to represent data, we're, we're representing it on various levels. So we have information domains and throughout most of this uh, presentation, I'll be using Archimate notation uh, to represent things. That's simply because it's a useful standard that we're trying to use uh, across many sectors. Uh, and the models that we produce, we want to be consistent with other things uh, that are readily available. So we have information domains. Now, those of you who know Archimate will know that this is not something that is usually used for uh, data. Normally, we start with business objects, but here we're starting with a domain, which is a container for pieces of data about a particular subject or representing a particular type of data. So in this case, uh, it's a domain representing data about individuals. Uh, in, we talk about information concepts and elements. This is where we use uh, what Archimate calls a business object, though that again is one of those things where as an architecture community, it's almost as if we're trying to step away from the community we're trying to serve. So rather than use uh, a word that they may readily understand, uh, we've called it a business object, which is a bit nebulous, it's a bit mysterious. If you, I found talking to people on the ground, if you talk to them about information elements or concepts, then they immediately get that this is data that is about something. An element is part of the data, a concept is the entirety of the data or some data object that they're using. Uh, when we start to get a little more technical, then we get down to our logical data where we've used a, a data object or in parts of our organization, uh, we use ERDs. Uh, so entity relationship diagrams and especially when we get down to the attributes of individual uh, data elements where we have to start listing those attributes and their types and their uh, and their ranges then we're forced down into ERDs because 
Archimate no longer gives us the tools to work with that. So uh, the examples that we've got here, we've got a simple entity from an entity relationship diagram and an entity with an attribute. And obviously there'll be a list of those. Archimate also gives us a way to represent physical data. Uh, so this is a uh, artifact that is called an artifact. And it's used to represent all kinds of things in the physical structure, uh, but we use it for data. We model the data on trying to capture various different things. So we try to capture the context of the data with our information domains. So that's a very high level, high level concept that allows us to logically group the conceptual data together, which brings me to the conceptual data. This is that information that is structured logically, split up, lives inside the domains. Uh, there is also a slightly different conceptual data, which is business data, which are those information concepts that we were talking about earlier. Those are the things that the business recognizes the information that they use. It's perhaps not as neatly structured as our conceptual data, but actually it's more useful to the business. And those things are then worked out in a logical layer so that we can begin to uh, understand how we can structure uh, the data to work along with our systems and processes. And eventually, of course, it becomes a physical artifact. It's interesting to note that actually these conceptual and these logical layers give us different ways to question and structure the data. They don't have to be the same as one another. In fact, very often they won't be, but they give us ways to make the information that it contains more useful throughout our enterprise. So if you look at the modeling layers, we've got a contextual layer, a conceptual layer, a logical layer and a physical layer. So in the top there, you'd have your information domain. In the conceptual layer, you'd have those things that fill up the domain logically and those business pieces of information that uh, you, you use to talk to the business with. What we tend to do is once we've understood the business data that we then look back to our conceptual layer to think right how is that data actually constructed sometimes we do that in the logical layer as well and we can start to apply rules to how how to control that data there and eventually of course you come down to the uh, artifact itself and this is where you'd apply your physical rules so you actually look at the data in your organization and see if you can assess its quality properly, see if it's fit for the job that we're giving it. Uh, the business data rules that we've got in the logical layer aren't really just made up. Uh, they're a combination of things that are rules around the conceptual data. So to do with the nature of the data itself, whether it's a number, whether it's text, whether it's an image and the business rules that are uh, associated with the business data. So how we're we going to use it and what we're going to use it for. All of this helps us understand the life and the use and the purpose of our data through the organization. This gives us different lenses that we can use to show people uh, the data. So for people who are interested in that high level view, we can say, OK, we've got an information domain model here and you will see that we've got information about individuals and organizations and resources and courses and research and scheduling. And these are intentionally supposed to be inclusive concepts that people can recognize. So anybody coming along will be able to say, yeah, I can recognize in the services that I give that I'm interested in individuals and the roles they play. And 
the scheduling of when these things happen. So it gives people in the business a fairly simple way into a fairly structured world. And sometimes it's better to show some information elements within there to help that understanding. So uh, this may be a little controversial. I've put a product uh, domain, but within that there are courses, there's research, there's publications, and in some organizations uh, it, there may be physical products as well. But people will be able to recognize that actually, yes, Within courses, we have programs, we have modules. Those programs are at certain levels. They might be delivered through different study modes. And so that is gathering information together about the courses. Helps people understand what those domains are talking about. We also, in discussion with the business itself, uh, develop models that are reflecting back to them the phrases that they have used about data. So this is an example from human management, uh, HR management, uh, and you can see that when they were talking to us, they talked about staff members, employee contracts, employee absence, all these kinds of different things which you may not see reflected directly in some of the other models because these are useful concepts to the business but in many ways quite nebulous. If you were to say that you got information uh, about a staff member then surely that is something to do with the contract their record of attendance, the benefits we're giving them. So it gives us a way to talk to the business in ways that they understand, but that we can then in, uh, interpret back into our world as to how, how these information concepts are constructed from actual elements. And eventually, of course, we move to the use size of capability model. Uh, and we should be able to associate with uh, this model the kinds of data that help us deliver those capabilities. Uh, you may all have seen the use size of data model. I don't know if you have, uh, but it's it leaves a little to be desired. The dis, there doesn't seem to be any connection between the capability model itself and the data model. So in Leeds, we've been doing a bit of work to try and rationalize this a bit. It still has a very long way to go, uh, but we're beginning to uh, reduce the number of concepts and make them more generic. There are things in here that are still absolutely wrong uh, because they're not talking about information, but they're talking about uh, capabilities or events. So if we were to look uh, through this model, you would find many, many examples of things that are not really information, but are actually a capability that we deliver. But this is beginning to talk more in the language of the business. Now this is, this brings to me to uh, the way that we discover our data and the way that it's held in our organizations because data is often difficult to extract from the situation it was created in. And so if we look at why that is, it's because across our organizations, we've got lots of silos, lots of different departments, all with different priorities, all that work in a different way and all of them have different processes embedded in them and they offer different services. So to satisfy that, to help them deliver those services effectively, then we've, we've created and delivered lots of different systems. Then those systems, we've incorporated lots of different processes mainly incompatible with one another. Now this is the environment 
this siloed insular environment where we have got our data. This is where it lives. These are all moving to their own beat. They've all got different priorities. They all move at different rates. They all have different purposes. And so it's hardly a surprise that we find it difficult to share the data between them because we're looking at the data as part of that process. If we were really to step back and look at data, how it lives across our organization, so step back from that technical view of this data is in that particular system to serve this particular uh, process. What actually happens to our data? Well, if we were to look at the data lifecycle in any of our organizations, we'll find that we'll dump data into a system. It lives for a while in the university and eventually, if we're applying proper measures and proper procedures, it gets deleted. While it's living with us, uh, people come along, they want to use it, so they extract that data. And usually they have to do a bit of tidying up before they can use it because it's not quite what they wanted. This is happening all up and down the life cycle. So all the way through the time that the data is in our systems, different people are using it for different purposes. And each of them having to tidy it up because, you know, it's not quite the way we expected it to be. In Leeds, we're trying to put in place data stewards and owners uh, that will understand how this data lives through the organization. And so they will be able to clean it up and optimize it for use throughout the life cycle. And then these people up and down the life cycle can just use it. I know that makes it sound very simple. It's not quite as simple as that. To, to make data that reusable, we need to understand its nature. So what it represents and why it represents that. And one of the principles that I've found throughout years of uh, working in architecture and systems is that actually life itself is quite flexible. And if we model our data around the reality of what we're trying to model, then it becomes intrinsically more flexible. So to illustrate that, if you think that we hold data about a person, we should make that data similar to the nature of a person. When, they, when you're uh, a student, you are not an, an intrinsically different person to when you're a lecturer or when you are a train driver, or when you're a husband, or when you're a wife, you are the same person. So we should ensure that we can use that information about the individual in all the places that that, that individual might occur. If we look at the data lifecycle in a slightly different way, then our data owners and stewards will create that, creating value for the university. So they've created some information about a person. Uh, one person wanting to use it actually might just want to understand their contact preferences so that they can get in touch with them. They need their name and their address and their nationality, but they can contact them and that contact will add value for the university. Somebody else actually for the task that they're trying to do will want a lot more information because they need to dig into the background, they need to give them proper support and all the way through the life cycle of this data people will use different aspects of it for different purposes. But you see what we're doing here is we're looking at how the data lives throughout our organization and how it adds value to each part of our, our organization so that we can structure it in a way that delivers the best value 
for the things that we're trying to achieve. So we've taken it out of the individual processes and started looking at why and how we use it. That's what we're trying to do in the university at the moment. As I say, we're very early in, uh, in the journey, uh, but we're doing that using various architectural techniques and most especially talking to the consumers because they're the people who know the data. They're the people who understand it. They're the people who understand what they're trying to achieve. Let's step back to the architecture. So looking at capabilities and uh, data as part of the infrastructure. Let's just look at a very simple uh, example where we've got some information domains of locations, individuals, courses, and we're going to look at uh, information about a student. There's a tension here. As a technical community and architects, we want to keep this data pure so that we can reuse it everywhere. Uh, as a business community and as architects, we want to make it useful. These two things pull at one another because to keep it pure, then we need to think about the structure of the data. We need to think about its qualities. We need to be precise and careful about how we use it. Uh, I had to be careful how I uh, ordered the things in this list because I realized that if I'd ordered them a slightly different way, it would have uh, probably spelt out what the business think we do with data most of the time. Um, but the bit, what the business want from data is they want it to be simple. They want it to be understandable. And so they want us to use natural language rather than our technical terms. So if we were to walk through an example, actually in the business, in our business, people are interested uh, that they're dealing with a student. They may be interested in the fact that that student is registered on a few different modules and that those modules form part of a program that gives them a good understanding of the context of that information. As an architecture community, we might want to look at that slightly differently. Remember, we want this to be reusable, so student is just a person. A person may have one or many addresses. That person may be registered on a module, but that module will always be part of a program. And actually, it's that relationship that means they're a student. And you can see within this construct, actually, you've got many other relationships that might be applicable. Uh, if they're a tenant at an address, then they're a tenant. If uh, they're teaching a module, then they're a lecturer. If they own the place where somebody lives, then they're an owner. But it's the same individual, the same concept. And so we've got something there that we can understand in more detail. So the student is a role that the person plays by virtue of the fact that they are on a module that is forming part of a uh, program of education. To get to the point of what people need and what our businesses need, it's often easiest to go to the processes and what it is that we're trying to achieve. So we create things that we call uh, customer journeys. So if somebody is, uh, people who with a business architecture background will recognize that. So if a service is being delivered, then the customer interacts with it. They have various, uh, various interactions with the service. Each one of those interactions has a purpose, but each one of those interactions is dealing with some information that is either being passed, uh, passed into the system or taken out of the system so that we can achieve some purpose. And so by 
looking at the processes within our organization, we can begin to build a picture of how data is used throughout the organization. And these concepts that we use, concepts that the business recognize, we can relate those back to our more technical architecture to understand where they fit in. So if we look at our business capability model, we should be able to start to say what information domains are useful for the various parts of this uh, delivering these capabilities and what information elements would help us deliver them. We may want to go down to a much lower level and say, OK, we understand that goals and forecasts and plans and things are useful for these parts of our strategy or corporate governance. And actually, then we can say these things live in those information domains. And the reason behind structuring it this way is that people will find it easy to find the information that they're looking for, regardless of whether they're coming from the ground, from uh, the business or from a technical viewpoint. They all tie together into the same structure. So our capability domain model for uh, an architect might like, look something like this. Uh, we've got those capabilities that we're trying to deliver and the information domains that are contributing to delivering those. And from the business point of view, it might be a slightly different view using language that is more akin to the things that they use in the business itself. So we have tools to focus on two different communities. The other thing to remember is that data is the center of all our architecture. The reason that we create systems, that we design processes, that we deliver services is so that we can get the effect we want. And the effect very often is to make a decision or to make something happen. And we do that by passing data between these systems or between these processes so that we can control what's happening. And so our data in our architecture is related to every single aspect of the systems and the solutions and the processes that we're trying to develop. Whether it's a business service, whether it's a function, whether it's an application, whether it's actual software that is delivering something, they're all related to different parts of the information hierarchy. Actually, we get really precious about this. Nobody cares whether we deliver an architecture. Whether what they care about is whether we deliver a solution that helps them deliver the value that they is important to them. By using data as a central theme that hang these things together, then we can bring together the aspirations of our business and the aspirations of our technology and our architectures and our processes to help them work together to deliver value for the organization. And when I talk about value in an HE uh, environment, it's a bit different from the way that we consider value in uh, many businesses because it's not just about the money. It's about the outcomes that we're trying to deliver. And that's why it's really important that as we develop our architectural model and we relate our data to the systems and artifacts that we're creating to deliver that data, we connect that up to the business drivers and the, the understanding of what it is that we're trying to deliver as an organization because we get too focused on making our beautiful architectures efficient and effective. And too often that becomes the focus of what we're doing rather than trying to deliver the outcome that the business needs. That's why 
in here when we talk about conceptual data and when we talk about all the things in our architectural meta model, they all have purposes attributed to them. They all have qualities. They all have the motivation. Why are we doing this? Because without that, we can deliver nothing useful to our organization. Data is just one part of the whole. We've got to find ways to represent and to understand all the different aspects of our organization from the stakeholders that we have, whether they are part of our universe, university executive, whether the students, whether the cleaners, whether they are the community that surrounds the university. They all have needs that we can try to deliver. And those needs we will represent uh, in statements of uh, strategy from the university. So we'll have goals and those strategies will require the capabilities delivering those capabilities that we have articulated so well in the uh, USISA capability model. And those capabilities will be delivered through customer facing services. Each of those services will have a customer journey and that customer journey will be supported by a service journey. So we understand how these services and how the applications uh, work together to deliver the goals and the needs of our stakeholders. It's consistently connected. So we can do this at all sorts of levels. We can do it at a very high level, saying this information domain helps us deliver this capability, or we can drill right down to individual services and say that this data that we hold in this system is vital to deliver that process. And by having it all connected, we can see the implications up and down the chain. It's connected across all aspects of a university or all aspects of a business, covering our businesses, our services, our technology, our motivation and data at each of those levels to help us express how the information we have and we hold and we curate helps us deliver those goals. mindful of the time and I want to leave you some time after this so I'm just going to step through the looking glass uh, so the data for architects why are we interested because in our jobs we need to understand what our organizations are trying to deliver now these four statements are taken out of the university's strategy document we want to provide an outstanding education we want to be seen as a fantastic place to do research but we want to help the community in which we're uh, in which we live as well so that it's not just for the university but it's for leads and probably something that often gets forgotten we want to ensure that our students are safe gets forgotten because it's a really difficult thing to do so our architectural meta model we can represent all these things we can represent how we measure how we're doing we can drive that down to say to deliver these we're going to establish some service lines and those service lines will have goals that contribute to our university goals. And if we were to look at uh, a specific service, then OK, we want to attract new students. And so we've got a recruit students uh, service. In actual fact, we'll have a lot more services in there because student services, they want to apply for courses. They want to uh, check what options they've got. They want to be able to change. They want to be able to swap. They want to be able to see their timetable, all kinds of things that we could express as customer facing services, all facing our students. Each of them with goals and measures that help us understand how well we're performing. We can look at those services in a different way. So as a student goes through their life with the university, how do they interact? What stages do they go through? What stages are these services appropriate? 
And eventually, when you uh, drill down to it, how would we then design those services? What would be the ideal customer journey? If I want to apply for a course, I want to uh, see the courses that are available to me. I want to shortlist ones that may be useful and that I think I'll be good at. I want to apply for them. And I want to be able to go back if there are more things that caught my interest. There's information that we need to uh, work alongside that. So in our meta model, we've got customer journey that is helped by an information journey where we place these things that are important uh, to the individuals who are accessing our services. And then we need to understand our application processes, how we support delivering that information to that individual so that they can achieve their outcome. So we see the data forms a central hub that we can follow through the life of a student, through the life of anything within our organization to see how it's used, how it's consumed, how it's created and how it's modified, to see what goals are contributed to, what the purpose of that data is, the context of that data and what needs they're satisfying and what value that is delivering to the university, its community and its uh, the wider UK economy. There's an awful lot more to the meta model than this. I just wanted to give you a brief taste of skipping through the things that are possible if we begin to look at these things in a proper architectural way that is accessible to the people that we work with. Because if the stuff we do is not accessible, not understandable, then we become those mystics that people just trust because they can't challenge or people ignore because they don't know what we're talking about. Everything we do in architecture, in data, and in the business as a whole has to be geared towards meeting the needs of our customers. And we can do that using an architectural method and an architectural model that supports us. There's lots more that underpins this, but thanks for listening. I haven't been able to see your faces, so I can't see how many of you have fallen asleep. And I can't hear any of you snoring, which probably just means that you're on mute. <laughs> there's there's 81 attendees still uh, still <laughs> attending posts. Are so, they uh, still conscious? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, I think uh, over to questions if, if people have any. Uh, you can submit them via the, the Q&A function. Gone very quiet. So I'm not, not seeing any come in. Either either I've been extremely clear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got got a few comments just come in there. Um, so Good points made on this and so much. Uh, advice on where to start. Advice on where to start. Um, well, it's one of those things because of the way that we've tried to structure this method and this uh, and this meta model, you can pretty much start anywhere. But personally, I would recommend starting at the very top and understanding what the purpose of your organization is, what your organization thinks its purpose is, and then driving down from there uh, how the services that you currently deliver are contributing to that value. So uh, I suppose that's starting from both ends. Start, uh, start 
trying to understand the purpose and the motivation of your organization and then look at your biggest problem service, how that's structured and what it's trying to deliver. And uh, then you can spread from that service to the services around it that form part of a logical uh, service line so that you can begin to rationalize the processes and understand how those are delivering value to the organization. It will take a while, but once you begin to understand those and the information that is common between them, that information will give you a key as to how to integrate those services and make them more effective. Because much of what we do within those uh, organizational silos is repeat what somebody else has done very often on the next next desk to us. So by looking at the overall needs of the uh, organization and our biggest problem services, we can start to address the uh, the things that we need uh, that will give us give us the best value first. It will take a while, but because you can do this at a very high level, then actually you don't have to complete all the detail to start delivering value. Does that help? Yep, I think so. Uh, St Stefan, are you um, monitoring? Yeah, the um, um, there was a comment uh, from uh, Heidi in Oxford about, um, you know, you mentioning the that the you size a data model needs a bit more work, and she says, um, mm. have you looked at the Cordit data model because that seems to be a bit more that's something that they've used and then they found really useful. So are you, are you aware of the Cordit um, data model, uh, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware of the Cordit data model. Uh, I think uh, they both have their good points and their bad points. Uh, I think they're good as a uh, as a uh, place to start, uh, but neither of them are, are really effective to be able to structure the data the way that we'd want logically and consistently across the organization. That's why I think they need to be supplemented by uh, the strict information domain model that helps you uh, develop a taxonomy and an ontology and those things combined will then then help you sort of deliver more automated services in the future as well but no i think the really good places to start uh, the thing to do is to take those and take them critically with your systems rather than just accept them. OK, thank you. Um, do, do, do we have a question. Uh, what are the main challenges you have faced in educating people into this way of thinking? Uh, we have several questions around that that topic actually about um, you know the adoption um, of 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 what you've presented to us today and and how long another one is how long does it take an organisation to adopt this methodology and can you give an example of our, or an organisation that has done this well? So th there are a few questions around the same topic. Yeah, uh, I think it does take a while. Um, unsurprisingly, people. When you start these uh, discussions, it's important that the discussions are driven by the needs of the business. Uh, and if if the business can see that you're genuinely trying to address their problems, then they will engage. Um, I found that you, part of the reason that I'm so uh, so wedded to using data to do this is that is something that uh, people in the organization recognize because they use it every day in their jobs. And so starting out with just talking with them about how how they use data within their processes and how that data helps them achieve their ends gives you a way to start to introduce some of these wider concepts. And because they're based around um, many of the service design uh, methodologies, you're talking about things that people are actually doing. So you, you're you almost adopting this mechanism 
by stealth. You're talking about things that are important to them as individuals in achieving their their goals, but you, while you're doing it, you're using language that introduces them to this wider, more connected world that uh, understands the flow and the ebb of our systems and services. It, to be honest, the hardest thing is to keep up with where they want to go <laughs> because you've got limited resources and it does mean that you have to do some re-education of your architects and your technical people because you've got the two groups of technical people you've got the technical people who think that their application that they've maintained is the only thing that is useful to the university and so they will protect it. Uh, you've got uh, the business community that don't care about what applications they use, they just want to achieve their ends. So it, it's it's an education thing that uh, in the university we managed to get people talking about data, people that you wouldn't expect to talk about data, we got them to talk about that. Uh, but it took a few months of uh, engagement, engagement using words that they would understand. Uh, and so it's an education process. We've, we've been going a year and I think the architecture community have got it. The business community have de definitely got it. Our difficulty is that we can't keep up with demand. OK, thank you. Well, I think we may have time for one more question. I'm just going through because we have received actually quite a few questions. Just going through to see if there's something a little bit different that we can touch upon. Uh, I'm quite happy to answer, answer questions later. So if you want to yeah, forward okay. things through that we haven't. Yeah, and quite okay. happy to make this uh, presentation. Yeah, we could do this because we we, we're sort of running out of time now. Unfortunately, we have one minute left. Um, so I always talk. Maybe, like, maybe we'll um, do that. Maybe we'll do that. We'll collate the questions. Um, maybe um, Paul, you can answer them and we can collate that and distribute yeah. back to to the community after. That's a good. Uh, that's a good shout. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, and also, you know, there's obviously a lot more to this meta model and the uh, process than I've been able to cover here. I could rattle on for ages. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a technique that I've developed over many years through many different companies. I used to work for uh, the DWP, I worked for Talis and I worked for uh, banks and all sorts of places. This is just the latest place that we've tried it and it's a mechanism and it's a process that works across all layers of the organisation. So I've found. Great, thank you Paul. Um, Stefan, yeah, we'll, we'll capture the questions yeah. and, um, and then we sort of circulate those back. Uh, to the community, but we've, we've had a chance to let Paul answer them. So thank you everyone for attending today. I hope you found that interesting. And Paul, thanks again for, for presenting with us today. That's OK, thank you for having me. Great, thanks everyone. Stay safe and we'll, uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.